Barely detectable by the naked eye, but it's here. You just have to look hard enough. Climate change. In places like Kenya, the effects are less hidden. The drought killed this one. Emissions from factories like these in China, cars and other sources are causing the global average temperatures to rise, according to the majority of scientists. But for years, claims have been met by counterclaims, meetings, conventions, industry lobbying, and now voices from scientists and politicians who disagree with efforts to reduce emissions. Many people are left wondering, what is really happening? What can I believe? Is anyone making a difference? I don't look at the waves as much as I look at the current. We have waves and we have um, spikes up and down. But the important thing is, are we moving in the right direction? Yes. Are we moving in the right direction at the right pace? No. Christina Figueras heads the UN's attempts to tackle climate change. I sat down with her on Talk to Al Jazeera to discuss climate change and where things stand. First of all, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. Sure, thank you for the invitation. Let's start with a general perspective. After the Durban conference and ahead of the conference that will come in Doha at the end of this year, where would you put the state of debate about climate change? How would you characterize this particular conversation? I think it is progressing, but not far enough. I think we had definite progress in Durban, which was not very well covered by the press, um, perhaps because of its complexity. But I would say uh, three very, very clear measures of increasing progress, increasing uh, scope, and environmental ambition, three uh, efforts the government's put forward in, in Durban. The first, I, the very big question before Durban was, is the Kyoto Protocol going to survive? Is it going to die on African soil? Is it going to die in South Africa, in Durban? And the very clear answer to that is no. The Kyoto Protocol has not died. Governments have actually agreed to go into a second commitment period on the Kyoto Protocol. So very important that governments came around and said, those industrialized countries that are there, saying we will continue with a rules-based um, mitigation, which is bringing down the emissions of countries, a rule-based mitigation uh, process that is legal. So very important first step. But then the governments turned around and said, but wait a minute. The Kyoto Protocol and the industrialized countries that are under the Kyoto Protocol only cover maximum 10 to 15 percent of global emissions. So that is clearly not enough. So they made a second effort in Durban. And they said, OK, let us increase the participation, let's increase the ambition, and let's take in 80 percent of global emissions. So now we have all industrialized countries, including those that are not in the Kyoto Protocol, and 49 developing countries saying, we pledge, and each one has pledged over the past uh, few years, have pledged what they're going to do from now until 2020, so over the next eight years. So that's already, of course, the next very good step because that covers 80% of emissions. But governments in Durban then turned around and said, that's not enough either. And the very important thing that they did in Durban is to say, we need to cover 100% of global emissions. So they launched another effort that is meant to be globally, legally binding, and that will cover 100% of emissions, which means all countries will participate. And that is the big effort that they're now going to be embarking on between now and 2015. All right, well, what to me it seems you have just described is the view of a well-informed, extremely well-informed, individual who's inside the process, who's committed to the process, and who sees within the multiple strands of conversation, of argument, of debate, of politics, a general forward momentum. Is that fair? Fair. From the outside, here's what I see. It looks very I, opaque. Well, <laughs> let, let me describe just very briefly what, what I think I see, and that is uh, an international community that is not only ossified in terms of its thinking about this, but also increasingly fractured and increasingly divided. I see a, a group of, uh, of particularly Western-orientated, US-focused 
um, people who begin to doubt even the very basis uh, of the need for change. Uh, I see a media that doesn't have the time to really dig in to the process to the extent that it can really explain what's trying to be achieved. And I see a series of governments who are increasingly saying, why are you telling us to do as I say and not as I do and hampering our economic growth? Now, am I being unfair in this? No, you're not being unfair, uh, but you're incorrect. Uh, you're incorrect in this, in the, in this uh, following sense. Yes, there is a very difficult conversation in the United States. And, and just to take your three points. Um, and of course, it's up to the US electorate to decide what they're going to, what kind of leadership they're going to choose on climate and on many other issues. But the fact is that the US administration several years ago made a commitment of reducing their emissions that they haven't stepped away from. And they yet again reconfirmed that same commitment in Durban, and I have no reason to doubt that they're actually going to execute that. In fact, the United States government agreed to a legally binding instrument that they will negotiate between now and 2015. That is not very well known. Why did they do it? Because they wanted China on board. And they said, if we have legal parity with China, we will negotiate a legally binding agreement. But again, you're, 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 ta you're talking specifics here. Um, I mean, we could go into specifics, I suppose, and question whether what they're on board with is adequate and sufficient to achieve the aims that, that, uh, that have been put forward. But I want to still focus on this idea that at the end of the day, no one really quite understands what is going on here. And despite your efforts, and you are everywhere explaining and explaining, and so there are many others like you who do that, despite those efforts, it seems that people are becoming more confused. The anti-climate change lobby seems to be becoming stronger and stronger. I don't think they're becoming stronger and stronger. I think they're still um, putting forward arguments that have actually become weaker because the fact is that we do have more and more natural disasters every single year. And if you look back to your uh, youth and me to mine, we can see changes in uh, weather patterns. So it's not, uh, it's no invention. But, but, but more importantly, le let me put it this way. What do we lose? The important thing about climate change is that everything we do to address climate is actually a win-win. So let me give you a, an example that is perhaps much easier to understand. The first cell phone was produced in 1984. It was called the brick. It weighed two pounds. I had you could, you could speak for half an hour on it, and that was it, before you had to recharge it. And it cost $4,000. Now, it was a very popular phone. They sold out everything that they could produce. Now, let's see where we are in the information and communication technology just not even 30 years later. Well, the fact is that we are in the energy industry, we're in the same place that we were in the information technology industry 25 to 30 years ago. So addressing climate is actually a huge opportunity because what it tells us is we need to transform the energy systems that we have. We have incredibly inefficient energy systems everywhere, everywhere. We have one billion people who don't even have access to energy. And we have so many opportunities to actually become a much more energy smart society, which we need to do if we want to address climate, but which is actually a wonderful opportunity. I want to know who today would prefer to have a brick rather than the cell phone that you and I carry. But it's an interesting analogy, but at the end of the day, I come back to the, the, the situation which you face, and that is a, a large population uh, of a number of nations who don't see that as being the problem. What they see is uh, an organ organizations and individuals like you who are taking everything they recognize and promising a revolution. And you use that word quite a lot. I've, I've seen you do it. You use words like transformation and radical. This scares a lot of people. And they're looking at this and going, I don't want you to change my lifestyle. I'm happy with the way things are. And what you are but promising me is, better, is not proof. Well, that's a, that's a promise. But at the end of the day, conservatism isn't called conservatism for nothing. People don't look at this and see what you see. They look at a bunch of people who they can't control, promising them a future that they can't control, and they don't really like the look of. 
Well, but let's return to the cell phone. How many people reach out and say, I would much rather have a brick. Forget everything that we have right now. Toss my Blackberry, toss my iPhone into the garbage. I would rather have a brick. We don't do that. Now, had we seen in 1984 where we were going to go, that perhaps would have been much more guided. We didn't know where we were going to go. But, but the you, point couldn't, is couldn't there's you use huge the same? Couldn't you apply the same analogy to the oil industry then? Couldn't you say, OK, um, what we have now is, a, is an industry that is polluting uh, and environmentally destructive and ultimately catastrophic, but all we need to do is enough research to turn the brick of the current oil industry into the modern day cell phone by investing in research that will give us cleaner fuel, that will give us better use of the resource we have, rather than this radical transformation uh, which we're trying to propose that would completely destroy the existing set of things. I don't think anybody is proposing a complete destruction of what we have because that doesn't make any sense. The fact is that we will continue to be a fossil fuel uh, society. We will continue to use hydrocarbons. We'll continue to use um, oil, coal, gas. What we need to do, however, is to bring down the emissions of those fossil fuels to supplement them in their growth. We're going to have a huge demand of energy over the next 20 to 30 years because all of the developing countries are coming up to their curve. But bringing so, down the emissions means using less of the fossil fuels. This is the bottom line, isn't it? it well, but only in absolute terms. In relative terms, what you want to do is, the fact is that all exporting countries, oil exporting countries, will continue to export their oil because we will continue to use as our base uh, a lot of the hydrocarbons that are available to us. But the percentage of renewable energy with respect to the growth that we're going to have needs to increase. So we need to have more renewables. That doesn't mean that we're not going to have hydrocarbons. So it's about a complementarity on the one hand. It's also about reducing the emissions of the hydrocarbons, of the fossil fuels themselves. Though they are not, we have not done all of the research and development into technologies that are going to help us bring down the emissions of hydrocarbons. And we certainly have not implemented everything to do with energy efficiency. So just the energy that we had, if we were much more efficient with the energy that we have, independently of where it's coming from, would already be a huge step. So all of those things need to be put together. Just in this short conversation that we've had, it's already clear that there is a, a multiplicity of elements to this debate and, and, and a great deal of complexity to it. Why then do you think, and how damaging do you think it is, that so many people reduce this entire conversation to the simple idea of global warming? Even the phrase itself is in many ways misleading, but they still, they still just focus on this one thing. Is the world getting hotter and is this catastrophic for mankind? And they, that's all they want to talk about. Well, it's true, and that is unfortunately very, very simplistic because the fact is that uh, global climate change, which is probably a better way for it, is affecting different countries and different regions in different ways. So some regions will get more rain, some of them will get less rain and go into terrible de uh, desertification processes, drought, some will get hotter, some, in some areas the um, sea levels might rise more than in others. So, so there's an enormous complexity here. The, the atmosphere and the weather patterns that we have, uh, the climate patterns, are very, very complex. And so reducing it simply to climate warming or to global warming is very simplistic. But at some point, you have to use a proxy to discuss all of this. And so what many people have fallen into is the proxy of the temperature, and that is an average temperature rise. It doesn't mean that every single point around the planet is going to rise the same, but they have fallen into the proxy of temperature rise. So what do you say to those scientists, and there are a number of them, they're a minority, admittedly, but there are a number of them, well-educated, thoughtful people who look at the evidence that's out there and say, I don't see that happening. Well, to them I say, I see it happening, I have seen it, ha I have seen a species disappear in my lifetime. Uh, so I have seen it happen, but more importantly, what do we lose? If I know that I'm going to get on an airplane and that that airplane could perhaps have the slightest chance of an accident, well, I buy my life insurance, don't I? And otherwise I don't expose myself to risks. So addressing climate is very similar to buying life insurance 
for the planet. And it has the huge advantage that it has many, many positive co-benefits. So why don't we do it? Well, this goes back to what we were saying earlier on. People don't see it in those terms, do they? I mean, particularly, again, in America, they see the proposals that are on the table as being a wholesale shift in the ideology that they hold, the philosophy that they see governing the world. What you're proposing to them is uh, government control, uh, the elimination of a free market and free choice in, in the use of energy, all these kind of horrible things. No, that's that not what forward. we're proposing at all. Well, that's how they see it, isn't it? Well, I don't know how they see it because I'm not there, but uh, that's not what we're proposing. What we're proposing is a transformation of the energy industry so that everyone can have access to cleaner energy. Uh, what we're proposing is actually something that is, yes, it's going to take a while to get there, but in the long run, it's a much more healthy and balanced way of living, and it certainly does not pretend to interrupt with growth. The fact is we will have and must have a continuous increase of global uh, GDP and global economic growth, in particular because developing countries are just coming into that curve. So what it actually means is, let me go back to the phone. The first cell phone, the only thing that that cell phone did was carry your voice for only 30 minutes. That's the only thing it did. Today, our cell phones do everything except make your dinner. And I'm sure that we will soon have phones that can actually also make our dinner. Look at the use of that one little device. Look how the use of that little device has increased and multiplied absolutely exponentially for all of us users. Well, the same thing with each ton of CO2, each ton of carbon dioxide. Today, we're only getting so much economic value of each ton of carbon dioxide in order to get to the point where we will have a healthy atmosphere, every ton of carbon dioxide is going to have to increase its economic value to me, the user, by at least three to five times. But that doesn't mean that I'm not going to get the economic value. I will, just like I get much more value out of my cell phone. So it's all about benefits. What about the element of this entire plan that involves the supplementation of existing energy sources. I mean, a key part uh, of everything that this revolves around is the ability to generate energy from other sources. And that ability doesn't seem to exist right now, and no one seems particularly committed to investigating it very far. How are we going to make up for the energy demand that's coming out of India, out of China, if we're not going to fill the gap with fossil fuel? Well, there again, we have a difference of opinion uh, because I do think that there are governments that are committed to this. China, to begin with, is uh, the leading country in, uh, in solar technology uh, and in, is coming the number two in wind in the world. And they are investing more than any other country in these two technologies because they know that's the way they're going to continue to be competitive. To go back to your first point about the United States, the sad thing about the United States is that it could be the leader of all of these clean technologies in the world, but it's losing leadership because it's not investing in that cutting edge technology. I happen to be right now sitting with you here in Qatar, in Doha. Well, the Qatar government has committed to generating over the next 10 to 15 years, 1,800 megawatts of solar energy. That is more than anybody has ever dared to think of. Why are they doing it? Not because they're running out of oil, not because they're not one of the major exporters of oil, but because they know that those technologies are the technologies of the future and that it is in their interest to complement their exports of oil with the export of another energy that is going to be in high demand in the future. So they're looking out for their long-term interest. The idea, I understand, uh, and the hope, I understand. But are you telling me that at this moment in time, with the kind of carbon emissions targets, the kind of uh, general targets that you're hoping to achieve in Doha this year, are you thinking that we have the capacity in alternative fuel sources to actually, at this moment in time, is the state of technology sufficient to cope with the energy demands of the world and meet the targets that we want to achieve 
in terms well, of global warming? Strictly speaking, yes, and that's what that's not what I say, that's what the International Energy Agency says. The problem is not the existence of the technologies. The problem is much more the policies that we have in place or the absence of the policies, both at the international level at the, and at the national level, to actually be able to extricate from those technologies the 100% potential that they have. Let, let, let me stop you before we get into policy. Just tell me about the technology because um, I think I'm pretty sure in saying that most people believe that the efficiency and the productivity of anything from wind to solar to wave, anything we could call alternative technology, is nothing like approaching what we get from fossil fuel and nothing like approaching efficient enough to really deal with the problems that we're talking about. Yes, but you see, I think inherent in your comment is the belief that you have to substitute fossil fuel, and that is not correct. What we have to do is the growth in energy, the growth in demand of energy that we're going to have, we're going to be consuming much, much more energy over the next 20 to 30 years. So that growth needs to be partially partially fossil and partially renewable energy. It can't be only fossil. That's what we're talking about. We're not talking about exactly. substituting what we have right now. Right, and, and, and my question to you is, is there enough capability in the alternative technology, energy technology world, to cope with the, that rising demand? If we maintain fossil fuel use at its current level, can we pick up the slack with what else is out there? Yes, if we do all technologies at the same time, if we do uh, absolutely the full potential of energy efficiency, if we do all potential of concentrated solar, if we do all potential of wind, all the potential of um, uh, maritime energy, if we do all the potential of carbon capture and storage. But that is a huge amount of technologies that hold potential that is not either not fully commercial yet or even if it is commercial, it doesn't have the policies in place to actually, as I said, extricate its full potential. So in theory, yes, in practice, no. But the trend is the right one. I look, you know what, I, I don't look at the waves as much as I look at the current. Um, and I think maybe that's, that's what you're perceiving here. I look at the current and I can see the long-term trends, of governments, of companies, of, uh, of private sector, of, of the investment sector, and I look at the current. Yes, we have up and down, we have, we have waves and we have um, spikes up and down, but the important thing is, are we moving in the right direction? Yes, are we moving in the right direction at the right pace? No. One potential wave that is imminent is the U.S. presidential election. Now, you say that people are maintaining their commitment levels and, and pledging to increase, but... No, I said the administration. Which the, the U.S. administration is maintaining right. its pledge, yes. And we have the potential for a change of administration. Um, and that change of administration will, would bring in a president um, which, given what we've seen in the debate thus far, may well come to this com the conversation from a completely different angle. Does that cause you worry? Well, as I said before, you know, the U.S. electorate really has to decide what they want on leadership. What causes me more worry, actually, is the fact that most of the American public has not realized that they're losing out on a huge opportunity here. They're losing out on being the technology leaders of the future. Where is all this American investment? Where is, you know, made in USA? Are they going to buy from China the technologies that they're going to use? Apparently, they're going to be buying renewable energy from China. How, how is that going to go down the American electorate? But we do see the Republican candidates talking in terms of free markets, freedom of choice, um, let, the, let the market sort this out. And so far, the market seems to be preferring oil uh, and continuing the status quo. Uh, and under a Republican president, we're going to see a continuation of that. By the time we get to the Qatar conference, uh, we'll be very close to knowing who that next president is going to be. How does, how does 2013 look when you uh, consider the possibility of a Republican president? Well, I don't consider, you know, 2013 is going to be an interesting year because the fact is we're going to have many uh, countries going into changes in, in their uh, political leadership. So there, there are many moving parts, but those are waves, and I am, again, very, very committed to the fact that we are, even if, let's, let's take the worst case scenario, okay? Let's take the worst case scenario that the United States steps out of this whole effort for four years. Well, 
that does not stop the advance of this. It just means that the United States is severely hampering its opportunity to be a leader here. But it does not stop the world from moving forward into these two new technologies. So I'm looking forward to this year and to next year. We'll leave it at that. Thank you very much indeed for talking. Thanks.